chapter 4, and while you're turning there, I'll just kind of set the stage for the series of messages we'll be preaching um, throughout this Christmas season in one of the more well-known extra-biblical Christmas stories. Uh, Charles Dickens, in his book, The Christmas Carol, tells of uh, a man by the name of Ebenezer Scrooge that's visited uh, by the ghost of a former co-worker. And we know that Scrooge has kind of become synonymous with somebody that is a killjoy or um, just a downright miserable person. And Scrooge was especially so as he uh, just had a very miserable life. Well, as this ghost of his co-worker visits him, he takes him back to Christmas past to show him uh, what it used to look like and then Christmas present and then in Christmas future if he did not change his Scroogeness, and I think I created a word, but I like it, so uh, maybe I can coin it and make some money off of it one day. Uh, but to, if he didn't get rid of his Scroogeness, what was going to happen? And we're going to use that Christmas past, present, and future to talk about um, the reality of Christmas past, present, and future. And while the Christmas past obviously is set in stone, and we know Christmas future is also set in stone that we, like Scrooge, should allow uh, Christmas past to encourage us to change uh, or to reinvigorate our Christmas present, and obviously as that affects Christmas future. And so to see the first one of Christmas past, we are here in Galatians chapter 4. And so I'd like to read there, beginning in verse 1, and we'll just read down through verse number 7. Paul writing here says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is an owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God, would you go to the Lord in prayer with me this morning? Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to gather for uh, the preaching of your word. And Lord, everything we do uh, here is important. Uh, But Lord, when we allow you to speak to us through your word, uh, is perhaps the most important. And it's not because of anything that I can say or Uh, any special insight that may come from the study of your word, but it comes simply through the power of your revealed word to us. And God, we ask that as we dedicate ourselves to that for the next few minutes, God, that you would reveal to us the truths of this passage of scripture, Lord, that you'd help us to see the unchanging truths that are here. And Lord, we ask that you'd help us to Allow our hearts and minds to be drawn to your truth. For in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. There's a lot of things about the Christmas season, uh, but there, there are, is at least one aspect of it that just really frustrates me. And no, I'm not a Scrooge, so I'm, I'm not that uh, unhappy with it. But the thing that frustrates me about Christmas time is how good we are at compartmentalizing the things of Christmas. In fact, we've kind of demonstrated that a little bit this morning as we have sung some songs uh, that are great songs packed with theological truth, Uh, but it would seem kind of odd to come in here in, uh, say, June or July and sing some of the Christmas songs we've sung this morning, wouldn't it? Uh, Because we've dedicated these four to six weeks, if you're a pre-Thanksgiving Christmas person or if you're a post-Thanksgiving Christmas person, Uh, to compartmentalize, whether it be songs, uh, might be some decorations around your house that you pull out at a special time, uh, 
It might be uh, uh, certain events or certain family members that you'll see around this time of year that you wouldn't even think about spending time with the rest of the year. And it might even be passages of Scripture in the Bible that we've compartmentalized, that we expect uh, during the Christmas season that the pastor is going to ask us to turn to maybe Matthew chapter 1 or Luke chapter 2 or maybe the book of Isaiah 7 and 9 or as our Sunday school lesson did this morning, the book of Zechariah and some of the minor prophecies. And we compartmentalize thinking that uh, this time of year is dedicated to celebrating this event and, and, and these circumstances. But I think we do ourselves a disservice when we only celebrate the birth of Christ during the Christmas season. And when we only think about the events surrounding the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ and uh, all of the interesting uh, and prophetic statements that are made and all the prophecies that are fulfilled, to think that we can only celebrate the birth of Christ during one time of year. And the reason I say we should not compartmentalize that is because of how essentially important it is to our faith. It is a bedrock principle. Uh, of who we are in, in our belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and as our Messiah and as our Savior. And so that's why this morning we're not going to one of those maybe familiar passages of Scripture, but looking here in the book of Galatians at what Paul wrote uh, to a group of people much like us, the church that was in Galatia, that was made up mostly of Gentiles, but there were some Jewish people. And before we get to the particular text we're at, just setting the stage to help you understand the context of this writing, Paul is very concerned that the people of Galatia are buying into this idea that they've got to become Jewish before they can become a Christian or a believer. And by that, meaning that they have to abide by the Old Testament law, the things that are spelled out. Particularly, he talks a lot about circumcision. And so throughout the book of Galatians, you're going to see Paul emphasizing faith over obedience to the law. And that there is no difference between Greek and Jewish people because it just matters whether or not you have faith in Christ. And in Galatians chapter number 3, he is specifically talking about how believers are in, uh, in, in a sense adopted into the family of Abraham and we receive that same inheritance as was promised to Abraham. And so that's what he's writing about in Galatians chapter number 3. If you notice the first words of Galatians 4, he says, I mean. And that means that he is explaining what he has written to them in Galatians chapter number 3. So here in chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, I just want to show you that Paul writes this passage of Scripture explaining how we enter into the family of God that hinges upon the fact that Christ came in the fullness of time, born of a woman under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. So the first thing I want to show you, the first truth about why we celebrate Christmas past, we celebrate Christmas past because Christ has come. It has already transpired, and we celebrate that this morning knowing that Christ came at the right time. Christ came at the right time. One of the negative things about our human experience is that we love to figure out why. How many of you have ever heard your kids ask the question, why? All the time, right? It is the favorite and first learned question of children. And to be honest with you, I have not overcome that quality. I ask why a lot. And when we think about the fact that Jesus Christ was born, one of the questions we want to know is, why did he come when he did? Because as we, if we're at all familiar with the history of humanity before this particular day that Christ entered the world in that manger in Bethlehem to Mary and Joseph, we could look at a lot of different instances and say, man, that would have been a great time. For Jesus to have fulfilled his promise of becoming the Messiah and, and, and redeeming his people Israel and restoring them back to their proud heritage. I mean, you think about the time that they were enslaved in Egypt. Maybe that would have been a good time. Instead of Moses, let's have Jesus come on the scene. 
thinking through the book of Judges, and I, I've been reading through that particular book, and it talks about Israel rebelling, and then God sending a judge, whether it was Deborah, or whether it was Gideon, or Samson, and you look at all those events and say, man, that would have been a great time for Jesus to come. But let's fast forward it a little bit to our day. Don't you think it would have been pretty neat to be living in Bethlehem, and being able to, with your own eyes, witness and experience the birth of Jesus Christ. To, to be able to physically be there. And, and if you want to go beyond your own personal experience of it. Don't you think more people would believe in Jesus if there had been cell phone footage recording his birth? Do you think that more people would have believed in Jesus if he would have had a social security number? That we would have been able to track his fingerprints. That we would have been able to test his DNA to see exactly what was in there. You see, we could question, why did Jesus come when he did? And I believe that Paul answers this question in this passage about why Jesus came exactly when he did. So look at what he said there in verse number 4. The very first few words of that passage, he says, But when the fullness of time had come. Now the New Living Translation writes it this way, but when the right time came, and the NIV version says, but when the set time had fully come. And the majority of the other translations will write it like the ESV does, but when the fullness of time had come. You see, this phrase literally means that at the time predetermined by God from the very foundation of the world, from the very beginning of eternity, whenever that was, that God had set aside that moment in time in history that his son would be born. Certainly, there are other times in human history that we may think is ideal or more ideal, but let us not question the sovereignty of God this morning. You see, God's sovereignty means that God is in control of everything. And God's plan was not thrown off track when the children of Israel rebelled. And God's plan was not thrown off track when he realized that one day we'll have a better way of tracking his heritage and documenting the evidence of his existence. Because God, for whatever reason, from the very beginning of time, said that's what it's going to be. And no decision man could make would throw God's plan off track. But if we want to take a step beyond that, I believe that this passage of Scripture particularly gives us some greater context of understanding maybe of why that time was right. And in so doing that, Paul uses the illustration. It's a metaphor. It is a mental image of them to understand how they are now inheritors with Christ. He uses the illustration of a young child, literally in this context, an infant or a toddler that has not uh, reached the age of maturity, uh, that is not able to fend for themselves, to make their own decision, but they have become the selected heir of their father's fortune. And he says that that child is just a child until they reach that age as set forth by their father to receive the inheritance where they become a full member of the society as an adult. But notice what he says there in verse number 3. Referring back to that mental image, he says, In the same way we also... When we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. And so the, the application or the transference for you and I today to take apart from Paul's analogy is understanding the inheritance is not a financial inheritance as much as we may wish it were. It, it's not an inheritance of land as much as that would be nice. It, it is an inheritance of spiritual blessings, of having peace with God of having your sins forgiven, of having a home in heaven and a relationship with the Creator. But our reality before Christ came is that we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. That we were under the guardianship of the law. That's the analogy. We know and understand that God gave the law in the Old Testament 
so that he could show us what God's holy standard was. To understand how we would have to live in order to reach perfection. And to show us that we have no hope for that. The law served as a way for us to be able to identify the Messiah when he came and looking back on it to identify him. And to understand that he fulfilled that law perfectly so that we could have a relationship with him. And so when Paul writes about the elementary principles of the world, he's talking about the ineffectiveness of the law. To take it a step further, he's talking about the ineffectiveness of the Jewish religion. You see, part of what has happened from the time that uh, the Old Testament ends until the time that we pick up in the New Testament is a great perversion of the Jewish religion. It had a form and a feel to it that looked just like the Old Testament law. They kept some of the same rituals and some of the same uh, festivals and all of those things. But they had taken it and added a bunch of man-made ideas to it as what it took in order to be a good Jewish person. And Paul is reminding them that that is not going to get you into a relationship with God. That is not going to bring you into the inheritance. So he's revealing to them and to us the ineffectiveness of the things that they were trying to live by. And understanding that we don't have to live by that today. So there's a couple of takeaways about Christ coming at the right time that I want you to remember. And that is, first of all, that God is always going to fulfill his promises. And God is not going to fulfill them always in a way that you and I understand. And God is not always going to fulfill them in our time frame. But understand what God plans is going to transpire. And he's not thrown off by the things I do. He's not thrown off by the things you do. He's not thrown off by the things government does. What God decrees in God's plan is going to happen. And it's important to know that God's ultimate purpose has already come. That Christ has already entered the world. You and I this morning as we stand here and celebrate the Christmas season, we're not waiting on a Messiah to show up. We look back and we see that a Messiah has already come. That is the simple message of this. And that Christ came at the right time. The second truth about the fact that Christ has come and why we celebrate that is to see that Christ came as the right person. So not only did he come at the right time, but he came at the right person. In other words, Jesus was the one, the only one, who can do the job. Now, a couple years ago, I ruined, I think, a Christmas song for some of you. As I pointed out the inconsistencies of that well-known Christmas song, Mary Did You Know? And obviously Mary did know, okay? It's still a cool song. You can sing it if you wish. Just don't do it around me. No, I'm just kidding. I I won't say anything. So keeping in that spirit, I want to ruin another song for you this morning. This is not a Christmas song, but it is a well-known southern gospel song written by Marvin Dalton. And made popular by the cathedrals. How many of you have ever heard of the cathedrals? Would you just raise your hand so I can make sure you're awake? All right, we have several of you. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm doing. I'm not really criticizing the cathedrals. This is a great song. But there's one key theological error there, and I want you to think about what it might be. The song is called, Oh, What a Savior. How many of you have ever heard that song? All right, how many of you want to come up here and sing, Oh, What a Savior? Anybody? All right, I'm going to read it to you. They start out by singing this song. And I want you to think about, again, what the theological error is here. He says, he gave his life's blood for even me. That's not it. That's not an error. Then it goes on in the first verse and it says, Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. Oh, that's great. But the next word says, but then they searched through heaven. And found a savior to save a poor lost soul like me. The theological error there, again, it, it doesn't change the effectiveness of the song, okay? I, I'm, I'm picking a little bit. But the error there is that they had to search through heaven. 
to find a Savior. Because I believe what the Bible teaches us throughout the Bible, but also here in Galatians chapter number 4, is that there was no grand search for a Savior. Because Jesus Christ was plan A from the very beginning, from the very foundation of the world. He was the one, he was the only one who could come and save a poor lost soul like you and I. So look back at verse 4. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, when the set time arrived, at the right time, God sent forth his son, who we know to be Jesus, born of a woman and born under the law. So let's break those three things down. God sent his son, born of a woman, and also born under the law. God sent his son, tells us that Jesus Christ's mission from the time creation happened all the way down through present time, God was sending his son on a mission at the time he predetermined to redeem those that are under the law. From the very beginning of time, this was God's plan. So it reminds us that Jesus has always existed. You say, Daniel, I know that Jesus has always existed. Why are you telling me that this morning? Because there are people in the world who believe that Jesus was created just like you and I. And we're going to see in just a moment why that would change the effectiveness of his plan. But I want you to listen to what John wrote in the book of John chapter number one he said in the beginning the word and we know that to be Jesus based off of what is written later down in I believe it's verse 14 you can see the analogy there in the beginning the word already existed the word was with God but he not only was with God the word was God he existed in the beginning and, and, through, and God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought life to everyone. And so when that baby was born in the manger in Bethlehem, it's not just significant that he was born of a woman. It is significant that he was born already as the divine Son of God. So when he was born of a woman, he was born with two distinct natures. He was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. You say, Daniel, is that important? Yes, it's important. Because if he was only man, he would never be able to live perfectly enough to be able to serve as our substitute in life. But then the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary would be of no effect for us. And if he was only 100% God and did not truly take on humanity, then he would not be a Savior that you and I can identify with, but he would be a Savior who had no clue what you and I go through. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh, taking on that humanity and dwelled among us. In the book of Philippians, chapter number 2, a well-known passage of Scripture says, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was of, in the form of God, did not think equality with God is something to cling to, but he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born, of a woman, uh, born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 14 through the beginning of verse 15 says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same temptings, testings rather, that we do. The significance of all of that again reminds us that Christ came as the right person, both in the fact that he always existed and that he took on humanity, being born of a woman, so that he could identify with us, but it also says he was born under the law. Did you know that Jesus was a Jewish person? We might chuckle at that. It seems rather obvious to some, but there are people who would say that Jesus was not a Jew. But if you think about 
When Jesus met the Samaritan lady at the well, she asked him the question, Are you not a Jew? Jesus didn't correct her. And by being born a Jew, he was born having to be obedient to the Jewish law. That he had to keep the commands that were given. That he had to be obedient to the, uh, to, to the standards that God had created. He said of himself in the book of Matthew, Don't misunderstand why I've come. I do not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to fulfill their purpose. And so Jesus being born of the law because of his humanity was able to live perfectly according to it. And only Jesus could do that. So what are the takeaways about Jesus being the right person? Let's understand this morning that Jesus is the person upon whom the history of humanity hinges. It is no coincidence that we switch from B.C. to A.D. at the very time that Christ was born. But it's also a reminder that because Christ is who he said he was as the right person, that our own history hinges upon what you and I did and do with Jesus Christ. He wasn't just some rabbi. He wasn't a good man or a prophet. He was the very Son of God. So I ask us this morning, do we love Him as the only right person? Do we trust Him to not only know that He was God, but that He was also man, and that He knows our weaknesses? So to this point, in talking about why we celebrate Christmas Christmas past, we talked about Christ coming at the right time and Christ being the right person. But I want to show you thirdly and finally this morning, and don't get too excited, okay, because I know how to stretch it out. I've got 15 minutes left, and I plan on taking all 15, okay? <laughs> that Christ came as our only hope. It's one thing for Jesus to have significance because of his historical impact on the calendar, on the scriptures, what we read about, what people debate. But it's another thing to understand that the true significance of who Jesus was is about the personal, individual relationship that you and I have with him. And so Paul is laying out in this passage two specific reasons that you and I can look to Jesus and celebrate that Christ has come because he's our only hope. And he talks about, first of all, that he has redeemed us. The word redeemed there is a word that may not be familiar to you. It's a word that literally means to purchase something from someone. It is to buy. It is to ransom. It is to purchase something. So what is Christ redeeming? Well, he's redeeming the souls of humanity who belong to the slavery of sin, that in their own strength do not have control over their own lives. And that's one of the remarkable things about our culture. We celebrate individual freedom. We celebrate doing the things we want to do, when we want to do them, how we want to do them. But not understanding that apart from Christ, we are not our own individuals, that we are still becoming the slaves of sin And ultimately, the slave of the father of sin, and that is Satan himself. Because there is no true individuality. There is no true original thought. If you see all the things in the world that people are enjoying doing, all the pleasures of it, it, it's not unique. It's not individual. You can almost forecast what's going to happen. So before we're in Christ, we're enslaved to sin and we belong to sin and the consequences of that. But the Bible says that Christ was born of the woman so that he could redeem you and I. So that he could purchase us back and buy us back from our slavery to sin and put us into a relationship with God. The cost of that was the cost of his very own blood. That he shed as he was being executed on the cross of Calvary. Paul would write this in the book of Romans, chapter number 3, For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus, 
When he freed us from the penalty of our sins, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right when they believe in Jesus. So he's our only hope because he is our only hope of redemption. But he's our only hope because he's our only hope of a relationship with God. I want you to notice what Paul writes back in the book of Galatians in the last part of verse number 5 going down through verse number Seven. He says, so that, he talks about redeeming those in the first part, but in the last part, he says, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. So again, thinking about the general context, Paul is using the illustration of a child that is to come into an inheritance, but he is only a slave, meaning he doesn't have any extra rights, he doesn't have any extra freedom, he doesn't have any extra responsibility, he is just like one of his father's servants until the time set by his father. Now in that day, the time of being uh, where you're considered to pass from childhood to adulthood was anywhere from 14 to 18 years old. Now, do any of you know any 14 to 18 year olds that should be inheriting a great deal of wealth? I certainly don't. At 14 to 18, I couldn't have done that. Don't know that I could do it now. But in that time, that's what it was set at, between 14 and 18 years old. And he's talking about here that when we reach the maturity spiritually, which is understanding that Jesus was who he said he was, because he has redeemed us, that we now are receiving an inheritance. Why? Because we've been adopted as God's children. In that day, sometimes adoption was not even a blood member of the family. It could be a servant that because the master had no heir to give his fortune to, would bring somebody into his family. But when somebody was adopted into the family, they were not considered to be less than anything than a full member of the family. That they were considered a fully functioning, have all the rights, have all the enjoyment, have all the things that go along with that. And that's what God does for us. He takes us out of the world And he brings us into the family of God so that what we are inheriting are all the blessings that are given to Christ Jesus. The Bible says that we'll reign with him one day. Ephesians chapter 1 is a great treatment of this inheritance that I I won't take the time to get into, but it's a great passage to read. But he's talking about including us into the family of God so that now we have the inheritance of peace with God. We have the inheritance of forgiveness of sin. We have the inheritance of a relationship with each other. In a relationship with God. Because we are brought into, adopted into the family of God. But what I want you to see here. Is that it's not just that we are one of millions. That God looks at us individually as one of one. That being a part of the family of God does not mean that we have to fight for God's attention because God has so many other children. So it's not that we just recognize God as our Father, but we recognize God in a very intimate, in a very personal way. That's why he says there that the Spirit of God is sent to us. In the same way that Jesus was sent to earth, the Holy Spirit of God is sent to us. Why? To give us assurance. And to give us confirmation that we are God's child so that we can cry, Abba, Father. Now the word Abba there is an Aramaic term. It's not translated into English. You may ask, why not? The reason they didn't translate it was because there was no good way to translate that into English. Because it stood for a very intimate and a very personal relationship that we just did not have an English word for. 
And so it, they leave it there to show us the significance of this relationship. That he's not just some God far off, but we have an intimate relationship with him. And what needs to happen is you and I don't need to look at God as the great lawgiver of the Old Testament who is just interested in our morality. We don't look at the God that is our Father in the same way that we would look at a God that is just interested in executing judgment. We don't look at God in such a way that is just focused upon His anger and His hostility towards sin. But we look at a God who treats us now with love and mercy and graciousness. There's a key word there that says that we are crying, Abba, Father. One author, a commentator, as he was writing about this, said this participle, I think, talking about crying, is used in order to express, express greater boldness. Hesitation does not allow us to speak freely, but keeps the mouth nearly shut, while the half-broken words can hardly escape from a stammering tongue. Crying, on the other hand, expresses firmness and unwavering confidence. That is what is available to us because Christ has come. One other unique feature I want you to notice is in verse number 7. But before I do that, let me prove my point. If you look at verse number 3, he says, In the same way, and I guess that's a pronoun there. Somebody that knows English, correct me. We, is that a pronoun? All right, thank you. I, I should have just asked Miss Nancy. She's the <laughs> resident expert there. And that would be what kind of pronoun? Now I'm going to let you talk back to me for just a minute. Singular or Plural. Plural. If you look down at verse number 7, he says, so you. Now that is a pronoun, if I'm not mistaken. Is that singular or is that plural? Singular. Why did Paul do that? Why did he switch from the plural to the singular? And I believe he did that to drive home the point that yes, God is interested in a relationship with all of humanity. But God is also interested in a relationship with you and I individually. That God loves and cares about us. I recently started reading a biography. Of one of England's greatest politicians. A man by the name of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce served in the Parliament of England way back when, it was a long time ago, and the book goes into great detail on his life, and, but mainly focuses on his greatest accomplishment. Wilberforce is known primarily for his staunch dedication to the eradication of the slave trade in England. It was too much of a stretch for Wilberforce to start out his political career by trying to outlaw slavery. And so he took it step by step and said, first we're going to outlaw the slave trade, meaning that no human being could be bought or sold by those who were under English rule. And after many years of attempt, he was finally successful at that. In just three short days before he took his last breath on this earth, Mr. Wilberforce received word that the Parliament of England had outlawed slavery altogether. I would argue this morning that Mr. Wilberforce is one of the most impactful human beings that have ever walked the face of this earth. But yet I would not be surprised if you either didn't know his name or did not know the significance of his name. A man of such great historical import that truly changed the face of a nation is lost to the history books of time. Why is that? 
because it doesn't personally impact me. I didn't live in a time where slavery and slave trade was legal to understand the passion of the argument against it. To me, he's just a historical figure. But the book that I hold in my hands this morning, from the book of Genesis 1 all the way to the end in Revelation, I always forget if it's 21 or 22. It's one of those two, I think. Is the authorized biography of a man named Jesus Christ. In his life mission, from the very beginning of time, was to come to this earth to abolish the slave trade of the human soul. And upon his death, accomplish what was necessary to make it possible for you and I to no longer be slaves to sin. But if you haven't noticed, Jesus Christ's name is not and never will be regulated to the history books. Why is that? It is because Christ has come, is still having personal impacts on the souls of humanity. It means something far beyond the historical significance. It means something because the future of our very soul hinges upon the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. And so as we celebrate Christmas, celebrating Christmas past, we do that with the full assurance that Christ has come. My encouragement to you this morning is, number one, have you done something about Jesus? Have you trusted him fully as your Savior and as your Lord? If not, let's find some time to talk about it after the service today. If you're at home watching online, we can take some opportunities to share with you how you can trust Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. But as we celebrate the fact that Christ has come, let's do so with full assurance that he is our Abba Father. That he is who he said he was. He can do what he said he's going to do. And let's enjoy a relationship where we can cry out to him unfettered by any human emotions. And just enjoy a relationship because Christ has come.